In this lesson, we will be reviewing some important ideas from group theory. So recall that a set capital G with a binary operation which we usually denote as multiplication. This pair is called a group if the following three conditions hold. One, the operation is associative. So that is a times the quantity B C equals the quantity A B times C for any elements A, B, and C in the set G. Secondly, this set has an identity element. So to note the identity as E so we have an element E and G called the identity such that AE equals EA equals A for any A in the set G. Thirdly, every element of G has an inverse. So for any element A in G, there exists a unique element called A inverse. That's an element of G such that A times A inverse equals A inverse times A, which equals the identity. So sets with these three conditions are called groups. Some special types of groups that are commutative are called abelian groups. So a commutative group is called abelian. So this means that xy equals yx for any x and y in the group. Let's also recall the order of an element in G. The order of A and G denoted by A with absolute value symbols, absolute value bars. This is the smallest positive integer n such that a to the power n equals the identity element e. If no such positive integer n exists, We say that A has infinite order and we write the order of A equals infinity. So some common examples of groups. Some abelian groups consist of the set of integers under addition set of rationals and reals and complex numbers. These are all groups under addition. The set of integers mod n, these are also, this is also a group under addition. And we denote the cyclic group of order n by z sub n. This is also an abelian group.
So the set of invertible elements in the integers mod n is denoted like this. This will consist of all the elements that are relatively prime to n. The positive rationals and the positive reals would be groups under multiplication. Some common non-abelian groups. We have the dihedral group D2n, the dihedral group of order 2n, which consists of symmetries of an n-gon. The symmetric group of degree n, Sn, consisting of permutations of the numbers 1 through n. The quaternions, Q8, form a non-abelian group. And then we have a couple of matrix groups. The general linear group on a field F consisting of the set of the invertible n by n matrices with entries in the field F, and then the special linear group consisting of n by n matrices with determinant equal to 1 and entries in the field F. So these are some of the common examples of groups that we can use for various examples. So consider the set of integers and the set of rationals or the set of reals or even the set of set of complex numbers. The integers are closed under addition and inverses. So we can think of the set of integers as a subgroup of the rationals, the reals, or the complex numbers. So more formally, a non-empty subset H of a group G is called a subgroup denoted by H with the less than or equal to symbol. If H is closed under multiplication and inverses. Again, I'm using multiplication as just the general name for the operation on the group G. If G was an additive group, we would say close under addition and so, and, and so forth. So to prove that H is a subgroup of G, we have the following subgroup criterion. It is enough to show that one, H is non-empty, and two, for every element X and Y in H, X, Y inverse is also an element of H. And we showed that if H was actually a finite group, then it suffices to show that X, Y is an element of H. So some quick examples of subgroups. Given a group G with identity element E, the set containing only the identity element and the set G itself are subgroups of G. And these are called the trivial subgroups. Next, let's review homomorphisms. 
So suppose we have two groups, G and H. And we have a map, phi, from G to H. This map is called a homomorphism. If phi of x, y equals phi of x, phi of y, for all elements x and y and g. So we note that the product x, y is taking place in g, while on the right side of the equation, phi of x times phi of y is actually taking place in h. And so we see that a homomorphism preserves the operations and the group structure of G. So a special type of homomorphism is when the homomorphism is a bijection, we call this homomorphism an isomorphism. So if phi from G to H is a bijection, then phi is an isomorphism. And we say that G is isomorphic to H, denoted like this. So this means that G and H are structurally equivalent and this bijection phi is just a translation which renames the elements of G to elements of H. So structurally, the sets are actually the same. Some other notation that goes along with homomorphisms, the kernel of phi, which is actually a subgroup, and in particular it's a normal subgroup of G. This consists of all elements in G, all elements in G that get mapped to the identity element of H. So phi of little g equals the identity of H, which I'll denote as 1 sub H. So this is called the kernel of phi. The image of phi, phi of the group G, this would be the set of all elements H in the group H, such that H equals phi of some element of G. So equals phi of G for some little g in the group G. So this is called the image of G. So we know that normal subgroups play an important role in group theory. Before we review normal subgroups, let's talk about cosets. So let H be a subset, not necessarily a subgroup, of a group G, and let A be an element of G, then the left coset of H and G is the set AH, which consists of all elements A times little h, where h is an element of the subset h. So the set of all left cosets of h and g
is denoted by g over h. So we often say, we often call this g over h or g mod h, or just simply the set of, the set of left cosets of h and g. And then some facts we showed, we showed that if, if g is a finite group and h is a subgroup of g, then the number of left cosets of h and g, so that would be the order of g mod h, this equals the index of h and g, which is again defined as the number of left cosets of h and g. And in this case, we have a formula for this index and the number of left cosets, it equals the order of g divided by the order of h. And we proved this formula when we proved Lagrange's theorem, which stated that if g is finite, and h is a subgroup of g, then it turns out that the order of h divides the order of g. So you can take a left coset of any subset of a group g, but it's actually Quite interesting when the subset H is actually a normal subgroup of G. So let's recall the definition of a normal subgroup. So let H be a subgroup of G, then H is a normal subgroup of G. denoted by this notation. H is a normal subgroup of G if and only if every left coset AH equals the right coset HA for all A and G. Equivalently, A, H, A inverse equals H for all A and G. Equivalently, A little h, A inverse, is an element of H for all elements A and G, and for all elements little h in the subgroup H, which we showed is equivalent to the following a H A inverse is actually contained in H for all A and G. And we showed that each of these definitions, each of these statements could have been used for the definition of a normal subgroup. So normal subgroups are important for discussing the structure of a given finite group. And one important fact about normal subgroups is that if H is a normal subgroup of G, then the set of left cosets of H and G actually forms a group. So this is a group called the factor group or the quotient group of G 
by h. One more definition that I want to recall. A group G is called simple if G has more than one element, so G, the order of G is greater than one, and the only normal subgroups of G are the trivial subgroups. So the subgroup containing only the identity element E and the group G itself, if these are the only normal subgroups of G.